This is the 19th season of Bass Talk Live. BTL is presented by Bass Cat Boats, Strike King Lures, Aftco, Pro Guide Batteries, X Zone Lures, Shoreline Boat and RV Repair, Spro, Gamakatsu, Big Bite Baits, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods, Beatdown Outdoors, and Sunline. BTL, coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Dual show today, excited for today's episode. We're going to kick things off with uh, Brandon Card, former University of Kentucky. We'll just say it because I don't even think it exists back then. All American in college fishing. And then made the jump to the uh, Bassmaster Elite Series and then has had a wild ride in 2023. Testing, I'm sure, his faith, his FUD, the whole nine yards. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit. But I also wanted to talk to Brandon. Uh, he's one of the best in the business at finding out-of-the-way hidey holes. And I got a message from uh, Jody White of MLF yesterday. He's like, too much Demiki rig talk. We need to talk about the nitty gritty. He's like, can we have Biffle on for like a 20 part series or something like that? Well, we just had Tommy on before. So I want to talk with Brandon Card about finding some sneaky holes. It seems like over the course of his career, he's found some, some weird little patterns that have paid off that have nothing to do with electronics. So we're going to talk to Brandon Card about that. Uh, and then in the second half of the show, as always, uh, following the Bassmaster Open EQ event, Ben Milliken, will join us to talk about his strong, strong finish on Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma. I think he racked out a top 30 finish in that event, uh, was in the top 10 after the first day, had like 10 or 15 spectator boats following him around in an open, which is pretty impressive. And then with that finish, he jumped back up into uh, qualifying for the 2024 Bassmaster Elite Series. Let's bring, uh, let's bring, Brandon Card in here. Are you uh are you prepared for dealing with all that is and the and the circus that is surrounding Ben Milliken on the Elite Series next year, Brandon Card? Oh, I, I have no clue, man. Um the only thing I know about Ben is that um my buddy sent me a link to video for the um hover hover rig or something. And I, I hadn't even known anything about it. I knew about tight lining and all that for years and years. Uh, we actually do that in East Tennessee. Uh, but the little, the hover, I don't even, I don't even know what it's called. Hover something rig. Hover rig. You guys call it the Demiki rig in Tennessee, right? Because it's based off of the Demiki shad and the Demiki head. Like that is the brand name for it. That's like calling a stick bait a Senko. Exactly. But, but the way that Ben was doing it, he was taking like an actual uh, jig hook and kind of sticking it further back in the bait and then putting a nail weight and sticking it in the head. And that was, that was pretty cool, man. I, I can't wait to try that up north. Very informative. Uh, you know, he just laid it all out and just kind of, you know, I feel like he's uh, very educational with his videos for sure. And he's pretty darn good too through it. Uh, he's got through the grinders. He's caught it where he's supposed to. And like I said, he's in position to make the uh, to make the Bassmaster uh, Elite Series. So, uh, how have you been, man? I want to thank you for jumping on BTL. I know you've got some uh, some family in town, some doing some things. I asked you to jump on the show. Uh, I I kind of when did I talk to you? Was it about a month ago or a little over where I called you and wanted to get you on, and then we weren't able to connect. But before we head up to the uh, well, I head up for my northern swing up north, and then you guys head up for your northern swing for the Bassmaster Elite Series. I wanted to get you on uh, BTL to talk about probably uh, it would have to be the most memorable year of your life, wouldn't it? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, um, obviously, you know, family, like, you know, getting married and then, you know, having our first kid, that was very memorable. But as far as just health and, uh, you know, all that good stuff, uh, definitely the most memorable for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're, when you have good health, you don't think about it. You just take mm -hmm. it for granted. Uh, but when you have like a little health scare, like I did, you're just like, it kind of puts everything into perspective. You're like, holy cow, like this is crazy. Quick recap. 
you before the year started. Let's see if I can do this in 20 seconds. You got shingles, which I have not had, but I have heard I've had friends that had it. They said that in and of itself really sucks. And then as a result of the shingles, you got what you thought was Bell's palsy, which is where it's facial paralysis with a high, high, high likelihood chance that it'll eventually come back. Yeah, And there's some other stuff, fatigue, that goes along with it. But since then, you've discovered that you actually had a different syndrome, not Bell's yeah. palsy. Yeah, and then so uh, one that you didn't leave out was the viral meningitis. So, oh, so <laughs> that doesn't that, sound fun either. Actually, that was kind of the scariest uh, because, you know, people can – I mean, people get really sick with, with meningitis. So – I guess that was the most severe deal, but uh, I actually, after the 14 days of antivirals, um, I was pretty much healed of the viral meningitis. So that kind of, you know, took care of itself with the medication that I was on. Uh, but the facial paralysis has persisted, and all this started the first headache that I had, the the you know the viral meningitis headache. It started December 26 the day after Christmas. And so um, the the meningitis got better in two weeks. The facial paralysis persisted. I thought I had Bell's palsy. Uh, Turns out I went and saw a specialist about a month and a half ago, two months ago. And he said that I have Ramsey Hunt syndrome. And so Ramsey Hunt syndrome is just kind of a more severe facial paralysis than Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy, about 85% of the patients have a full recovery. Uh, Ramsey Hunt syndrome, about 50% of the patients have a full recovery. And so then basically the other 50% kind of has some sort of a partial recovery. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, looking at you now, based on kind of following your journey that you've done through social media, you're definitely recovering. Like it, it, it looks like, and it sounds like you're definitely seeing some, some, what is it? I wouldn't say their results. I feel like results are what you get when you like hit the gym. You're definitely seeing some ret- some improvement. Some improvement, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, I started to get movement uh, on the right side of my mouth again. And if you go back and watch some of the earlier mm-hmm. posts and stuff that I did, like there was no movement over here at all, and it was all just on the left side of my face. And so, you know, now, you know. I, I'm not slurring my speech as bad when I smile. It actually looks halfway okay. Uh, before, when I smiled, it would pretty much make a baby cry. It was like, <laughs> it, it was better to not smile. I was just like doing everything that I could to not smile. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I guess the, the big thing now is my eyelid still isn't working. Um, you know, my obviously my left eyelid's blinking fine, my right eyelid. Um, still isn't blinking and so whenever that resolves itself that'll be a great day because it's very annoying not having an eyelid that doesn't function you sounded like from what i remember a little bit of a decision as to whether or not you were going to fish i know that or, or when you were going to fish you had uh the Bassmaster classic that was in knoxville that was coming up you had two elite series events uh, before this and kind of hindsight. Now I want you to go back to February when you decided, and, and I think you're dealing still with some fatigue. And like you said, like running with the boat and special dude, you go out and you finish seventh in that first event in February after dealing with this from December 26 on kind of four months later, looking back on it, that had to be a very emotional moment for you and your family. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty wild, man. I, I I mean, I'll just I'll just kind of say what I think. I mean, I think it was like a God thing, just to be honest. It, it wasn't that I just went out there and you know figured it all out and you know just fished my butt off and got it done. You know, I'm not gonna take any of the credit. You know, I, I just think it was just kind of it, it was it was a it was a it was something bigger than me, man. I just feel like you know this whole entire deal you know, just from, from when it started and until now, um, you know, I just, I just feel like this is just, it's, it's bigger than me. Uh, you know, I feel like maybe it's, uh, God's kind of, you know, let this happen and, and allow everything that's transpired to maybe give people hope that's, you know, going through 
um, you know, hell struggles of their own or, you know, what, whatever the case may be, you know, I, I just feel like it's, it's something kind of bigger than, than me. And, uh, it, it was a cool experience. It was just a wild ride, man. I was just, people kept asking me about it and I was like, I can't explain it. Bass fishing's crazy. Sometimes when you try so hard and you, you know, and you think you're going to do really good in the tournament, you bomb. And then there's other times you don't even know if you're going to make it to a tournament and you literally just show up. And that's exactly what I did. I just showed up. The first day of practice was horrible. I, I, I called my wife. I said, I, I don't know if I made the right decision coming down here. Um, my eye was completely bloodshot, um, you know, and then something I haven't talked about, uh, on here is, is also had blood clots in my arms. Um, oh my gosh. From, from where they had the IV, basically I was on an antiviral IV for about six, five or six days. Um, for some reason at the hospital that I was at, they didn't give me any blood thinners. And so I don't know if that was an oversight or if they just thought since I was younger that I would be fine. Um, but blood clot set in on my left arm really bad. It, it was actually all the way from my upper bicep down to my wrist, which I don't even know blood clot could get that big. Um, but, but it was uh, on my left, it was bad. My right one, there was a smaller one on my right one. So I was all, you know, kind of worried about that too. You know, you, you hear about blood clots moving and all that stuff. And so uh, now the doctors did tell me before I went down there that it was in a smaller vein and the likelihood of the blood clot traveling in a smaller vein and, you know, ending up in your lungs or your heart would be very, very slim. Most of the cases uh, where you hear that is like a bigger vein, like one okay. of the bigger veins in your leg. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a lot going on. Um, the, the cold air, like the, the cold dry air, which we had a lot of that in practice down there in Florida. And then it actually kind of, kind of started getting warmer down there at Okeechobee. But the first couple of days of practice, we had a brutal, like cold front wind. And that's like the worst for my eye. Like, like if it's, if it's actually pretty warm outside and humid, I don't have to put the eye drops in my eye uh, quite as much as I do whenever it's like kind of a cold front and super windy. And so that first day of practice, it blew like 40 mile an hour or may, that might be an exaggeration, but it was 25 mile yeah. an hour. Place. And uh, my eye was just like completely red and blood, bloodshot. And I was just like, what am I doing down here? Like I felt terrible. Uh, it was, it was pretty wild in practice. It, it sounds like you, it, it kind of put into perspective a lot of things for you because you're thinking about stuff like you mentioned that. I mean, if is that continued through this year? You, you're having a great year. Statistically, you had the best start uh, to your year that you've had since 2015. And your first three finishes were 17th, uh, 19th, and 27th. You throw in a 16th in the classic there. And then after your last three events, you're sitting in 28th in the Angler of the Year standings. But at a time when you should have been sucking because you're worried about your health. Like I said, it was your best, best start in the last eight years of your professional career. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a trip, man. It's been a wild ride. That's for sure. Um, the first two events that I thought I was going to miss, I, mm -hmm. I was, when I was in the hospital, I was kind of, you know, figuring out the recovery time of all this and, and I felt pretty good about the classic because the, the classic was, you know, in the middle of March and I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll probably be good before then. But the elite series started the first of February, essentially, maybe it was the second week of February. And, and I was just kind of like crunching the numbers and like, like the recovery process. And I was like, I don't, I really don't think I'm going to make those first two. And, you know, I talked to Lisa, uh, our, our tournament director and, you know, just, I, I was like, I was like, what's the options? And she said, well, she said, you can just, you know, basically miss the first two and try to qualify for the classic in the next seven, which, which, I mean, technically, if you kill, absolutely kill technically, it. Technically, if you kill it, but then you're sitting there going, holy cow, I would have blown away angler of the year. <laughs> yeah. So that was a complete long shot. But then the other one, which is not very good either is, 
um, to like take a, you know, a, a, a medical like, exemption, a medical exemption. Yeah. And so I didn't, obviously I didn't want to sit out the whole season. So I was like, well, if you take a medical exemption and then you come back and she said, I think Brad Waitley did this towards the tail end of last year, you can mm-hmm. come back and just fish, you know, but, but it's non points. You're just, you're just competing for, you know, essentially cash at that point and glory. Yeah, and so that, that those are my options, and uh, and and I I didn't think I was going to make the first two, and it's it's pretty ironic that the first two have actually been my best two elite finishes of the year, <laughs> the the two that I thought I was going to miss. Yeah, seventh and then nineteenth at at Seminole. Yeah, pretty well. All right, any other health stuff, or can we move on to can we move on to some fishing stuff here? No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm pretty good, man. I'm just uh, ready for this eyelid to get better. But and that's just someday you'll wake up and it'll start blinking. Well, I hope so. That's you know that's what I'm praying for now. Now, like I said uh, earlier, fifty percent of the people have a partial partial recovery, and so I'm just I'm just hoping I'm in that other fifty percent that has the full recovery. Mm -hmm. So we're just we're just praying for that every day. But Uh, but my my blood clots are gone, so that's good. And so, yeah, everything's trending upward for sure. I looked it up. There's less than a thousand cases of this thing a year. It's wild. Yeah, I think uh, the only other Ramsey Hunt syndrome, I've, I've met a lot of people through this that have came up to me and said, hey, I've, I've had Bell's palsy. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandma had Bell's palsy, whatever. Uh, but I've not had anybody say Ramsey Hunt syndrome. I think the only other one uh, was uh, Justin Bieber. I think he had Ramsey Hunt syndrome last year. And I'm not a Justin Bieber fan, but doing my research of Ramsey Hunt syndrome, you know, his name pops up and I was like, oh, okay. So, but I think he has actually had a full recovery. So hopefully I'll, I'll be good here in a few months. I'm trying to look it up. I feel like there was another angler who had Bell's palsy. And I don't want to say the wrong guy, but I remember on the FLW tour a number of years ago, like, was it Vic Vadalero possibly? Maybe I, I remember. I remember something about Vic. Maybe uh, Bub Tosh too. Uh, and and the, the only reason I know Bub Tosh is that I'm sponsored by Irod, and uh, Matt, the owner of Irod, told me that Bub had uh, Bell's palsy several years ago. Hold on a second. I'm pulling it up. I'm in Bass Fan 2009. I know. I know Vic won a uh, Lake Dardanelle. FLW event, and maybe he was battling through something during that tournament. Yeah. I've, let me look through this. There's got to be. Here it is. Uh, he did it all despite the onset of a case of Bell's palsy, a usually short term neurological conditions that paralyzes one side of his face. He never had it before and didn't know what it was until visiting a doctor after the event. Oh, so so that was the tournament he won on Dardanelle. Yeah, and he, I don't know, you don't contract, he, he bells palsy onset during the event. So he won it with half of his face paralyzed and then went and, to the doctor afterwards. That's that's one heck of a story out right there. Yeah, I don't well, know how uh, the heck I remember. Oh, because those were the two years that I went to every single FLW tour event. That's how I remember okay. that. And then uh, Matt Newman told me that uh, that Bub actually won a tournament when he had Bell Spalsy. So th- there's kind of a trend here. Maybe my win's coming these next three events. Who knows? Uh, speaking of the win, I mean, you're 129 events in, we've seen you leading, uh, events before we've seen you in the top five before you do have a second place finish under your belt, but, uh, you're, you're becoming one of those guys that, that is talked about as far as overdue for a win or one of the best who hasn't won. We've seen guys like Bill Lowen kind of get that off of his shoulder. Well, I don't want to say off of his shoulders cause he's won a million dollars without winning an event, but, uh, it's kind of a good distinction to have cause it means that you're good, but talk about that win and, and how at this point in your career, what your dozen years into your career now, uh, you're still looking for that number one. 
It's, it's interesting, that's for sure. Uh, you know, like some guys come on the scene and, you know, win their first or second event. And then other guys, you know, like you said, Bill Lowen, I mean, he's the he's one of the best that has ever played this game. Yeah. Like, he really, he's, he's, he's top notch. And, and for him, you know, for it to take that long for him is just very surprising. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I go out, man, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of tournaments, you know, where, where you start out the event and you're like, uh, I might have a pretty good chance at this one, you know, and, 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 it, and it's interesting. Some of them are like that, like some of the fork events, you know, I, I felt super good about. And, uh, but then some of the other ones, um, you know, like actually like Texoma or, um, yeah, Texoma, the one I got second, mm-hmm. you know, that was like an absolute brutal practice in the last couple of hours of practice. I just kind of got on like a little flipping deal, just maybe like the last two hours of practice. And I was just like, okay, well, at least I have something to go on. And then that just kind of evolved into, you know, a second place finish. And I mean, I had the fish on to easily have won that tournament. Like that's, that tournament is so crazy. I, you know, I've never been on that much fish, but then um, not, executed you know I, I don't know if they just they were biting weird that week or what i know greg hackney lost some big fish as well so that kind of made me feel a little bit better um but there's so many fish that i that i had on i was hooked and they either came off or whatever the case may be that would have won the event so it was just uh it, that was a crazy week but yeah it's just you, you never know when you're going to be in that position mm-hmm. and uh I'm just trying to stay positive and just, you know, just focus on every event. And uh, when, when my time comes, you know, then I, I think, I think that that's just kind of what it is. It's like, if it's your time, you know, it's mm-hmm. your time. You've done a lot of uh, top 10 damage with a top water plug. I think you're underrated as far as a top water guy. I mean, everyone still thinks Zell roll and pop are that type of thing. But I mean, if I'm looking at this like 10 killer, that was that a top water plug a little bit little top water action at 10 yeah kilo. yeah that that was flipping in top water yeah and then uh you had a ross barnett deal where you were chucking a top water plug yeah and then the texoma deal yeah and then any of the fork was there some of the fork stuff on top no most of one of the years was, yeah most of that was cranking and uh you know dragging a big jig or something along those sorts swim bait yeah but you like that walking bait. You've turned that walking bait into a lot of money over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, you know, that's, that's kind of what I grew up doing. My, my dad, um, he is a night crawler fisherman through and through. Like that's all he likes to fish. With. Wait, like live night crawler, live night crawlers, but okay. he <laughs> tackle box. He, th- these are his two lures that he uses. He uses night crawlers and then he has two lures. He has a rebel weed crawl. It's about okay. that big. And uh, it catches bluegill and bass. And then he has a Zara puppy. Oh, okay. Those are literally the only two artificial baits that I saw my dad use when I was growing up. And so just watching him, you know, walk the dog and catching a bunch of fish on that little puppy all those years, you know, it's just, that's just, that's just what I knew as a kid, man. And like my brother and I, my brother's two years older. Um, we were obsessed with topwater walking baits, you know, since childhood. And then, you know, when I signed on with the Ozuri and saw that they had that compact, you know, it, it's bigger than the puppy, but, uh, you know, it's, it's still a compact two hook, um, the Yozuri pencil, uh, 3DV pencil. Um, and I, I saw how well that thing casts. It's a, it, it casts tail first every single time. And you can just make such pinpoint casts with that bait. I just fell in love with it, man. I, I was putting that, that walking bait where I could put a frog, you know, and, um, you know, of course it doesn't skip like a frog, but still, I mean, you can, you can put it where you want to put it. And, uh, yeah, I've just there for several years. It just seemed like a lot of tournaments really lined up for that bait. And, uh, what was the name of that bait again? Just the Yozuri 3DB pencil. It's the 100 size. Um, we also have a 125 size now. Uh, okay. But, but the 100 size is the one I like to fish around cover. And, you know, that's what I was doing at Texoma. That's what I was doing at Ross Barnett, 10 Killer. 
I was looking it up here. I'm trying to. Oh, there it is. There's the Yozuri website. What am I looking up? Three. Three DB pencil. DB pencil. Let's see yeah. if this pulls up. And it's, while you're doing that, I'm gonna have to figure out how to charge my phone. Hang on a second. Okay. Oh, there it is, right there. Hold on, let me share the screen. That right there. That's it. Sweet. Now, now that's the three hook version there. The, okay, uh, the two hooked version is one that they use for the blue backs a lot, right? I think so. Yeah, I, th I think Brandon Call throws it a lot uh, for blue backs. Uh, I'm I'm pretty new at blue back fishing, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a phenomenal bay, man. I just think just that compact size. It, it's got a one knocker in there, so it's loud. It's got a drawing power, um, and it just gets bit. It really does. All right, yeah, you figure out how to charge your phone. We're going to take our first break of the show uh, talking with Brandon Card when we come back. Uh, I want to talk uh, I want to talk about Suzuki a little bit because you're one of uh, a, you're, are you one of the original Elite Series Suzuki guys? Yeah, yeah, I was I was the first one. I I met him I met him at the Fort Lauderdale Boat Show in 2012 and uh, Okay, cuz I want to talk about that cuz that seems to be I'm seeing more and more Suzukis on the back of bass boats these days on both tours. So, uh I kind of want to talk about how that's going. I also want to talk about your swing up north. You've caught him on the St. Lawrence River before, but as far as top 10s, you know, you, you have not cracked the code of the north, so to speak. And you got three big events coming up because, I mean, dude, you legit still could finish in the top 10 of the Angler of the Year here in 2023, which would be one heck of an accomplishment considering how things have been. So uh, BTL on a Wednesday. We'll be back with Brandon Card, and then we will jump right into uh, Ben Milliken talking about the Open. We'll be back right after this. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry-leading design coupled with tournament-winning performance. The Puma STS from BassCat. Feel the rush. Everything you need. One legendary brand. A wonker, a two sandwich eating kind of man. And on behalf of all of those bigger, I gotta say it once and for all, it's bad enough that the fish look smaller in our hands. The last thing we should have to worry about is getting quality outdoor clothing that fits. Avco, any fish, any water. I'm the kind of guy that never leaves a house without a pocket knife, and Gamagatsu's come out with the EDC series of knives. EDC stands for everyday carry, so whether you're on the water or off, you can always have it with you. The best thing about it to me is that assisted open feature. With this D2 blade, you've got it right here at your fingertips, so if you can't find your scissors, you need to cut a knot, you need to cut your braid, you've always got it. Make sure you check it out. Never leave home without your Gamagatsu EDC knife. Born in Japan, using technology, innovation, and precision, Sunline produces the widest selection of fishing lines at the most technologically advanced line factory in the world. Manufactured at the strictest tolerances to produce victories at the highest levels of tournament bass fishing, from household names like Christie, Swindle, and Cruz, to young guns like Cook, Logan, New, and Welcher, they all trust Sunline to take them to the top of the leaderboard. Choose the line that will give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Sunline. Shoreline Boat and RV, dock rash, storm damage, collision repair, that deep scratch or gouge from trying to access that secret creek. Shoreline Boat and RV can get your prize possession back in mint condition and looking good on the water, fast. All repairs are done in-house, so they're able to get your boat or RV back to brand new, quickly. 
All Shoreline's work comes with a rock solid warranty. Find out more at shorelineboatandrv.com. Kansas City, Austin, and Tulsa. All right, welcome back, BTL, on a Wednesday, talking with Brandon Card. And, uh, dude, that was the most uh, bass boat angler thing that I've ever seen during the commercial break. Brandon <laughs> went to plug his phone in, and he returned with a uh, heavy-duty boat charging extension cord, which you can see in the wall plugged in behind him. And then your, I'm assuming your uh, phone charger is plugged into the other end of the boat charging extension cord. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, my I'm sitting in here in my wife's office, and uh, there's a there's a power uh, strip thing here, but my my cell phone charger wouldn't stretch, and I was like, what's the quickest way that I can hook this up? So I went out and grabbed my hundred foot extension cord, and uh, Country Boy can't survive. There you go. Uh, before the break, I, I mentioned uh, one of the longest standing. Uh, relationships with Suzuki, which I remember when they hit the market, everybody was like, wait, what? There's a new one. And there had been a couple other brands that came and go, but Suzuki really seemed to grab a, a, a share of the marketplace there. And you see a lot more of them uh, strapped on the back of boats. Now you're, you're a decade of decade plus into this thing with Suzuki. Yeah. Yeah. This is my 11th year with Suzuki. Sure is. It seems it seems to me like they're pretty dedicated to the bass boat market now. Yeah, yeah, they've uh, they made they made some really good strides. Uh, made a made a you know nice little impact in the bass fishing world. Um, I think that they were hoping that it would go quicker, you know, because mm -hmm. they they've got such a market share on the saltwater side of things. Uh, that they were thinking that the bass boat world would, uh, you know, would accept Suzuki a little quicker. The thing about bass fishermen, man, is they're just, they're die hard. Either they're die hard Mercury or they're die hard Yamaha. It's, it, it's hard, uh, hard to make an impact and uh, change people's minds. But yeah, I mean, just the reliability and the fuel efficiency of the Suzuki uh, just knowing, you know, guys know now that, you know, we haven't had a service crew this entire time, uh, you know, knock on wood, 11 years, no service crew and, um, you know, no major issues at all. And um, it, they just build one phenomenal engine. And so I think the guys that have realized that, you know, they're the ones that are buying the Suzuki's right now. Sure. Who is it? Who you still have? Ro, what? Rojas, Perch, Pipkins. You is Gerald Spore a Suzuki guy? Gerald Spore, Adrian Avina. Adrian yeah, Avina. Those are like the that's the original, uh, I guess Suzuki, you know, pro fishing yeah. team, if you will. Um, now there's also some other guys that that have you know have uh, put a Suzuki on their boat as well. Uh, I know James Elam. Perch. Um, huh? Is Perch running one? Yeah, yeah. Perch is part of the. He, okay, we've mentioned him already. Suzuki Pro Fishing Team for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Dean uh, went with the all white. What are your thoughts on Dean's Dean's Suzuki setup? Have you have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. In I person, saw it. Um, I think the white power poles. You know, definitely it, it helps. You know, it kind of brings it together. I don't think I could pull off white with my color scheme because you know I got so much black and blue, but. Uh, yeah, it, it looks pretty cool, man. I'm trying That's to find a up. picture of it. He just went all sure. ice this year. So he, he matched the ice in his jersey with the white seats of the blazer yeah. with the white power poles, and then he went white Suzuki. That's pretty slick. It really is. I can't find any pictures of it, unfortunately. Uh, let's talk about up north, uh, Brandon. Why is it that there are some guys who, are, who aren't even from up north just go up there and, and maul them every single time they're up there? And then there's other guys who never catch them. And you've had a top five on the on the St. Lawrence River before, uh, you know, eight, not eight years ago now. But uh, what are your thoughts about always for the last five or six years a third of the season ending it deciding the angler of the year deciding the classic spots on predominantly northern fisheries most often big smallmouth 
Yeah, so that, that top five that you mentioned, I actually, uh, most of the week I was catching largemouth. So that was, okay. that, was that, <laughs> that was that one event where uh, the smallmouth were weird, they were skinny, and the largemouth showed out. Me and Greg Hagney uh, both got a top 10. Uh, actually, both we got a top five. He finished the top five as well, uh, targeting largemouth. But uh, that was, uh, I don't think that's ever going to happen again. <laughs> Uh, because of just the, the amount of gobies that's up there and those smallmouth, it's just crazy how fat they are. Like you catch one and it may be 18 inches long and you're like, yeah, it's a three and a half pounder. And then you put it on the mm -hmm. scale and it's like four and a half, four and three quarters. It's just insane. So um the the large mouth days are, are over and, and i don't i don't target them anymore i mean after that event obviously if you get a top five finish on the st lawrence targeting large mouth you try to do it again and i try to do it several other times and i did scratch out one other top 20 finish doing that uh, but then i had a bomb after that and i was just like okay i'm done with them but uh but yeah i mean i think the reason why i struggled for so many years targeting smallmouth is that the smallmouth in East Tennessee, where I grew up, they act totally different than northern smallmouth. And, and I mentioned this talking to Mike Iaconelli the other day on the Ike Live show. And, and they're like polar opposites. Like, like the smallmouth down south, when it's cloudy, windy, rainy, you know, they get super aggressive. And like that's when you catch them, you know, power fishing, you know, throwing a crankbait, throwing a spinnerbait. But then when it gets real calm and sunny, they really, they don't hardly bite in East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Like if it's calm and sunny, you're going to have to like drag a Ned rig and just, you know, something on the bottom, super slow. Up north, it's the exact opposite. When it's sunny and calm, they get super aggressive and you're supposed to be throwing, you know, crankbaits, centerbaits, topwaters. And uh, then when it's cloudy, you're supposed to drag stuff. So it's just like the opposite of what I grew up. And it just took me a long time to just try to, you know, figure all that out. And, and I mean, I'm a lot better than I used to be, but I'm, I'm still, you know, learning. Every time we go up there, I learn something new with those small mouth. Well, you catch them up there. You're in position to make uh, your fifth classic in a row. I don't think a lot of people realize that. There's not many people that can say so. 2020, 2021, 22, 23, and then the 20. 24 classic on grand lake that'd be cool yeah and your seventh Perfect. classic overall especially since I've, I've already had two cracks at uh grand lake classics and i didn't fare very well in either one of those and so I, i'd like to i'd like to have another chance i feel like especially now with the you know the forward facing sonar and and the, the brush files and all that we saw it last year you know, with the red crest at uh, Grand Lake, you know, yep. I feel like I feel like I could I could do a lot better this go around. Good stuff. Well, like I said, I know you have family there. I greatly appreciate you jumping on BTL. It looks uh, it looks like you're doing a lot better. Obviously, a long a long way to get back a hundred percent, which will hopefully happen. But glad to see, uh, glad to see you're smiling. I mean, dude, you yeah. got a you do have a legit smile now. It's not just half a one. So. Yeah, I can actually smile and not make my little boy cry. So that's, that's oh, a good thing. Oh, yeah. And, and then we'll all, we're all on board for the blinking here soon. But, man, the way you've handled it, the way you came out of the gates, you inspired, you caught those fish, had a great uh, a great start and a great to the year, and then your social media with, uh, with your updates and your positive attitude. Uh, I know you've probably gotten a lot of support and a lot of people have reached out, but I noticed it and uh, and wanted to get you on the show. So. Yeah, man, I sure appreciate it, man. I look forward to hopping back on here soon. All right. See you, Brandon. Good luck up north. All right, buddy. Thank you. All right. That was Brandon Carden. Like I said, just a crazy story. Uh, had some headaches and woke up and half his face was paralyzed. It's crazy. Uh, like he said, you don't realize you don't value your health. It's like, here's the way I'll say it. And we'll bring in our next guest, Ben Milliken. What's up, Ben? What's going on, Matt? How we doing? Good. Uh, I'll say it with this, and I want you to either confirm or, or agree with me or disagree, but you don't realize how, how much you use your little toe until you bang it, stub it, or and then you're like, every time you take a step, you're like, damn, I use my little toe a lot. It's kind of yeah. like with health. You don't realize, you don't, re you don't appreciate it until it's at the forefront. 
Absolutely, man. I actually, uh, I had Bell's palsy, uh, two years ago. I think it was, I had really? an ear, ear infection and, uh, kind of something similar. I was lucky that it wasn't something super serious, but yeah, like half of my face was like, I couldn't move it for like, uh, two or three weeks. It was crazy. That's wild. And then it just, just sister just got just, better slowly, just got by better. slowly, slowly got better. Cause he was saying he's got the Ramsey hunt syndrome, which has less than a thousand cases a year. It's crazy. And then he was fishing with a blood clot and his doctor's going, well, it's in a small vein. So you have a very low percentage chance of it, like traveling to your heart. And I, I would have been sitting there going, yeah, well, there's like 700 people on earth that get this other thing every year. And now you're saying it's a small percentage chance on the blood clot. And yes. then he went out and fished the best he's ever fished. Yeah, scary stuff, man. <laughs> uh, you ready to talk about the open? Thanks for jumping on. I know that uh, I know you're busy catching six pounders yesterday, based on your social media stuff. But let's talk yeah. about Lake Eufaula in Oklahoma, my backyard. Uh, let me ask you this: Are you feeling the pressure yet? Because now you're past halfway through, and you are in the driver's seat, man. You are in the top eight. You are. Right now, if it ended today, qualified for the Bassmaster Elite Series. How's how's the nerves in the mental game? Oh, yeah, I'm stressed and, and nervous, of course. But I've kind of been that way every tournament the whole way so far. So just kind of trying to manage it all and take it day by day. But uh, I, I got to tell you, after practice at this you fall Open, I was about to have a damn panic attack uh, just based on how it all went. Uh, and I just didn't feel like I was getting those couple quality bites a day that all the guys I've been talking to um, had been seeing. So I was, I, I don't know. I, I kind of just had to put my head down. Uh, we'll get more into that, but uh, yeah, I was feeling it after practice at uh, you follow for sure. Talk about, uh, talk about what your game plan was during the practice, how you plan on attacking the lake. And then uh, it seems like kind of just based on our little conversation or text that, you've gone into a lot of the tournaments like hey i'm gonna catch their i'm gonna catch him this event uh this one i was not the case yeah for sure man i um i i know i i listened to the other day you and joey talking about how you each went about breaking down the lake in practice and i guess i was a little bit more i was kind of in between i guess what you guys did i tried to sample as much of the areas that i had heard had a population of fish um, as possible. I tried to stay in a little bit more of the cleaner water. I, I was really worried that there was going to be, it was going to fish extremely small, just mm -hmm. by how many people I kept seeing in practice in those areas. So that Longtown area, um, the Porham area, and um, God, what's the, the, um, the one down there on the south end? By the triangle? The no, oh, the, no the, uh, Bixby? Not Bixby, but the, the south side of the lake down there. Oh yeah, east. that big Big cove yeah. on the right, uh, uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, that's what it is. Um, that in the triangle. So I, yeah. I really focused my efforts on those areas just because I had heard that's where, like, I'd seen past tournaments from there. That's where a lot of the tournaments had been won, and those areas were good. So I prefer to fish cleaner water. Um, so I, I really tried to break those areas down as much as possible. Kind of did my usual day one, day two, try to get bites in those areas figure out the nuances of the baits and the presentations the fish like um, and cover as much water, do as much scanning as I can. And uh, yeah, the first day I got there, I caught like 15, 16 pounds and I was feeling pretty good about it. Cause I was just kind of dinking around, stop in one spot, catch a three pounder. It's like, Oh, I like to flip a worm. I'm going to go try that. Oh, there's some good trees. I'll flip those. And I'd catch like two, two pounders and a three and a half. I was like, okay, well this lake's supposedly loaded with three to four pounders. I'm on track to head do and have an average tournament and then after day one and I, I had i fished a little bit harder towards the end of practice than than i had planned on but after day one i never caught probably more than 10 pounds any day and wow. so that made me extremely nervous um but kind of as i got in the tournament um what i was hoping was the reason for that kind of came to fruition which was i just wasn't slowing way down in those productive areas and spots and really understanding what type of baits I needed to put in their face and how methodical I had to be about it, which kind of seems to be the case. Every one of these opens is, is really dialing in these super sneaky, finesse type presentations and, and kind of giving the fish something new that they haven't seen in the previous six days of practice in the tournament. And so uh, that really paid off for me. 
22nd place finish. You had a top 10 after day one uh, anchored with a big fish. Now, one of the things that I thought you would struggle with on you fall that you didn't struggle with because you finished 22nd was there's not really schools of bass. It's not like you scan past and say, ah, there's the school on the ledge like you might at a uh, you fall in Alabama or Toledo Bend or some of these Texas lakes. It's seem kind of spread out did you did you find that and was that something that you were looking for schools and weren't able to find or did you find kind of a needle in a haystack yeah i I probably spent way too much time looking for groups even if they were groups of three to five fish Mm -hmm. offshore spent too much time looking for them in practice um and so i think that's that's kind of another thing that kind of led me astray that had made me pretty worried was that i didn't find any of those areas um, and that I'd kind of have to just fish around a lot of people and fish the same stuff the same way as they were. So yeah, that, that definitely made me very nervous going in, but I was lucky enough that I found a couple really key spots and, um, I'm kind of realizing in these opens that I, it's such a mental game with, you can't have one spot, two spots, three spots, one, two, three different patterns or baits. You literally have to have like 15 things in the back of your head and an area that you're in right there to just go and try to run because there's going to be people on it. The fish are going to get beat up. And on top of that, obviously they're going to move and and like they always do. So luckily I was able to uh, day one. I mean, it made the entire tournament for me and really made the entire season for me. If I, if I do get lucky enough to qualify for the elite series, I had two catches, especially one, a six pounder on day one that will be the reason that I would make it because those, each of those two fish, especially the six pounder probably jumped me up 20 plus places uh, in the standings. How'd that six pounder go down? I mean, man, it was kind of crazy. I've, I, the first day, so I caught the four pounder first. um, But the first day I had like one small keeper in the box after I had run like three or four of my productive areas. And it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I fished a brush pile that had been pretty productive for me. And I could see some fish in it, whatever. Um, and I couldn't give them a bite. And so I about picked up the trolling motor. I said, all right, let's get out of here to tell my co-angler. And I panned over and I saw a fish like two feet down, like in eight feet of water from the surface. And I was like, all right, I'll make a cast of this really quick. And I had just like a 16th ounce shaky head with a four inch worm on it. And I pitched over to it and I must have hit it in its damn mouth because I didn't see the fish. The fish didn't move. It didn't light up. Nothing. It just stayed there, and my bait went right to it and stopped going down. And I didn't feel a bite or anything, and I reel up, and it's on, and I was like a four and a quarter or something like that. Oh, my gosh. Totally just a random kind of You said two bite. foot down over eight foot of water, so it was just under the surface. Yep. Just sitting, just chilling. Yeah, just swimming around. There was a bunch of, I was fishing a brush pile that was kind of on top of a hump. It was actually like a, uh, it was one of those ones that has a buoy on it because it's it's yeah. like a state placed brush pile, which is funny. But um, yeah, there was constantly fish swimming around it. And so it made more sense the more I fished that area. And so I catch that one. I was like four and a quarter. I was like, okay, um, we're going to stay here for a second. And then I caught two more two and a halfs out of that brush pile um, on a jerk bait over some time. I was like, okay, cool. So then I had three fish and I was feeling pretty good about it. Well, I went a couple more hours without a bite. 